can commit is to be ungrateful. Even if I wanted to be, I could not be. I want to thank each and every one of you. Thank you. I want to thank all of the artists who performed, all of the people who worked with this, the Emancipation Committee, all of you who came. I want to thank you. I want to let you know that I know that the only reason that justice advances in this country is because of your tireless effort. And I want you to know that this is greatly appreciated by those of us who fight for justice. We are told by psychologists and psychiatrists that by the time a child reaches the age of 10 or 11 years old, they've already been formed in their attitude towards life. I left Trinidad between that age, so by formation, I must always thank the people of Trinidad for giving it to me. Oh. It's both collective and individual. Sitting here is my uncle, Hugh, Hugh Anthony, who was one of my teachers. Do you remember? He was the one who used to beat up all the time for not doing his work. He forgave me, but I didn't forget him, you know. <laughs> my Uncle Hugh and all of my uncles, all of my aunts, all of my families, all of Trinidad helped to educate me so that they would let me know that I had a responsibility to help alleviate the sufferings of my people. And for this I shall forever be grateful to God. We know in life that everything we know in life that everything affects everything else. Now, of course, uh, some people will try to bring confusion to us. Here we have some water on the table. This water, look, as it has no relationship at all to the air in the water. But if we drop the temperature of the air to zero degrees Celsius, this water will turn to ice. Conversely, if we raise it to boiling pressure, this water will transform itself to steam. Everything is related to everything else. And as revolutionaries, it is our task to understand this because there are certain forces that may come about that you might miss. We have many political forces that made it possible for us to come to the country at this time. Of course, the first one we will always let you know is the countless masses of people who continue to hammer away to lift the ban. Those whom I will not know, because I know that the true makers of history are the millions of nameless, faceless people who come at the drop of a hat to advance the glory of God. I will never be able to thank them all personally, the only way I can thank them is to continue to work for our people, and that I shall always do without the slightest hesitation. Everything affects everything else. If we were to look at the period of colonialism, and we will look to the end of colonialism, we will see the end of colonialism came immediately after World War II. We must analyze properly the forces that made this possible. One of the forces that made possible the liberation of the oppressed from colonialism was none other than Adolf Hitler. It was Hitler who wrecked Britain. It was Hitler who wrecked France. It was Hitler who wrecked Belgium. It was Hitler who wrecked Portugal. It was Hitler who wrecked them all. And as soon as they were finished, Indian jumped up. Roy came forward. Gandhi they have to deal with. And Abdeka was in them. India had to be liberated. After that, it was all over for British imperialism. <laughs> Over. Therefore, this relationship must be properly understood. Certainly, none of us wanted Adolf Hitler. No African praised Adolf Hitler. But it is a fact that Adolf Hitler weakened colonial powers in Europe. And this weakening of colonial powers in Europe made it possible for Africans and Indians and oppressed people all over the world to strike a blow for colonial, against colonialism. And they did not hesitate to meet up the demands of history. Now, coming to this country is the same thing in a backward way. It's the result of many forces. We point out only two. Of course, the first is that we repeat what we said from the very beginning. The ban was totally unjust. There's no question about it. 
man was totally unjust. I have never committed any crime in Trinidad. I did not belong to any political organization in Trinidad. I never even made a political comment against Trinidad. On the contrary, as a young man, I was proud of Eric Williams, author of Capitalism and Slavery, a book which our party still uses to this day and used through the ban on our parties and will continue to use because it is a good book. We say, be not warned by the author, but the words which he has written. <laughs> Understood. Anyone knowing anything about the history of any oppressed people know that oppressed people fight all the time for their liberation. The form of struggle changes, but struggle never stops. We must be very careful to look properly at the struggle as it changes. If I were to give you just an example of the struggle of our brothers and sisters in the United States, we can see that from 1954 to 1965, within the short space of 10 years, their struggle had capitulated itself over three times, making forms dominant to change rapidly. If you would look at the struggle in the United States in the early 1950s, you will see this struggle was a legal struggle. Here, Africans giving their money to the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People took all the courses to all their all their causes to the courthouse and pleaded before the courthouse that they would find that the demonstration discrimination which arrested against them was unjust. While they were busy fighting in the courtrooms, a woman by the name of Rosa Parks sat down, and when she sat down, we got up. We got up. By 1952, the dominant form was the legal form. By 1955, with Martin Luther King, the dominant form became nonviolent protest. By 1965, 1964, we've already documented 14 rebellions, but by 1965, Watts was there, and this one could not be denied, and that marked the point of a new form, urban rebellion. Because just in the short space of 10 years in the United States, the struggle went from legal in the courtroom, nonviolent demonstrations in the streets, to of course the burning of uh, cities in America. So too, our struggle continues to change. Since the 1960s, many people think that for some reason the struggle has stopped. The struggle has not stopped. It has gotten deeper. The struggle has not stopped. It has gotten more complicated. Therefore, the weak fall by the wayside, but the strong get stronger inside the struggle. Stronger inside the struggle. That's one of the reasons why I'm here for this constant struggle. I said that Trinidad was God. I never met one person born in Trinidad who met me outside of Trinidad that ever told me, we're happy you were banned. Every one of them said, it's unjust. Every last one of them that I met told me, it was unjust. It was clear it was unjust. Of course, as an act of injustice, I understand as a revolutionary, you can do anything against me. That's not my problem. You touch my people, I'll kill you. That is my problem. <laughs> As uh, Brother Tony told you, I've already been banned from England. I've been banned from more countries than most people visit. <laughs> That's, true. That's true. And I've never committed one crime. I am twice banned from England. That great democracy there. Twice banned in 1968 banned. I've committed no crime. All I did was speak. They said it's the truth. Speak. So I told the Africans they're the truth. I said, listen, the only country in Europe that didn't exploit us was Ireland. So you got no business fighting Ireland. You should join hands with Ireland against England. It's true. It's true. It's true. Ireland is the only country in Europe that didn't oppress us. Because she was colonized by England. These are facts. They won't misunderstand them. Oh, they have banned me. They twice banned me. But uh, we know it has nothing to do with me. As a matter of fact, when they banned me the second time, we were trying to establish a party, about, a branch of our party there, the old African People's Revolutionary Party. When they banned me, we sent two brothers from the United States. Now one of our strongest chapters is in England of the old African People's Revolutionary Party. The struggle is not about Kwame Ture, it's about our people, and that is where it must always stay and focus. So therefore, it's a constant struggle of the people to live this ban that makes it possible. You have two particular forces that came at this time. Now we said that colonialism was a result of, the freedom and colonialism was a result of Adolf Hitler weakening colonial structures. If you will look properly, it is the progressive forces in the 1960s 
in this country that has been leading the band, has been able to put together the Emancipation Committee, has been able to lift the band. So you have your progressive forces who have continued the struggle, have never left the struggle, have come results finally to arrive at the struggle where we're stopping people being banned all over the Caribbean because of what they say. We must thank all the progressive forces for this. It is you who done it, and I thank you. Now you know when you speak revolution, you must be brutally honest. And so I want to make a brutally honest statement to assist it carefully. Brother Roosevelt uh, Williams, I know very well. So when I was in the hospital, he called, he asked about my health. I told him everything in school is coming along. Then uh, I told him, so what are you doing? I said, well listen, I've been out of Africa. This is the longest time in my life since I've been in Africa. Over 25 years that I've been out this long. And there's a lot of problems there. And I've got so much work, I've got to get back. He said, well, before you go back, you got to go to Trinidad. I said, go to Trinidad. He said, yes, we're going to have a tribute for you there. So he explained the whole lot of things. So I thanked him. I called up some people at our party. I ate our party. Uh, we had very sharp people. Uh, one said, what's happening? I said, well, they said, I need to go to Trinidad. You know, if they invite me, the band is lifted, all that. You know, I just have to go. He said, you're going to go to get a tribute in Trinidad? I said, yeah. One person said, how are you going to do that in Trinidad? Another person said, they got an Indian government. He won't do it. <laughs> The Indian government can't stop them. <laughs> Only an African government can do that. <laughs> we, do, we do want to move a little about Indian uh, government, you know. Uh, we said earlier, and it's true, that uh, one of our press things there that, you know, I'm always in contact, I'm always in contact with people born in Trinidad. Now, you must know I'm a Pan-Africanist. Our party has chapters in Tanzania, South Africa. Our party has chapters in Ghana. Our party has chapters in Guinea-Bissau. Our party has chapters in Gambia. Our party has chapters in England. Our party has chapters in the Virgin Islands, in St. Lucia, throughout the Caribbean, throughout America, in Canada. And of course, there's a very busy task to coordinate all these things, but we stay on top of it. But for one minute, I never forget Trinidad. I follow it very, very intensely. Very intensely. Very intensely. And I meet people all the time, get analysis, find out, we get materials coming, and we're always in contact with these progressive forces. Trinidad, always. Even though we're banned, we contact through letters, through messages, through all the... So the contact is there constantly. And, <laughs> Since the uh, contact was uh, building up more and more, and uh, we saw it as uh, the new elections were coming, we sort of recognized what would happen. And then what happened, people started calling. Did you know what happened? Oh, in Trinidad, oh God, boy, we got an Indian government. I said, for true, they said, for true. I said, it's Indian, they said, yeah. I said, was it Trinidadian? They said, well, you know what we mean. I said, no, I don't know what you mean. <laughs> Is it Indian or is it Trinidadian? Well, you know what we mean? I said, no, I don't know what you mean because you didn't call the other government African, you called it Trinidadian. <laughs> so, there must be some confusion here. I know what the confusion is. The confusion is that when you use the word Indian and Africa, there seems to be no dichotomy. But somehow when you use African and Trinidadian, there seems to be some dichotomy. There's a reason for this, and the reason is the oppression of capitalism, the oppression of colonialism, and the oppression of imperialism. First, it comes to confuse us. In the first place, the Africans and the Indians are oppressed here in Trinidad. That's clear. That's clear. They're, we're oppressed by imperialism under a neo-colonial structure. That's clear. But we were not oppressed the same way, although we both oppressed. As we gave out the example, the Indians have their music, they have their movies, they have their names. Africans don't even have their names. <laughs> Imperialism, while exploiting the Indians, allowed their culture. But in exploiting the Africans, they did everything possible to destroy our culture. <laughs> Therefore, in the struggle to make a proper contribution in humanity to rehabilitate ourselves, it is clear that the Africans must focus on their history, which of course is the guideline to their culture. <laughs> Therefore, emphasis on African history becomes a necessity where it may not be a necessity, even though it should be, 
on the Indian side to get the proper history of India because even the Indians in this country do not even know the proper history of their suffering in this country. <laughs> Therefore, it is important for that to be. But the Africans need to build this up. The Africans need to understand what Africa did to them. Unless they understand their relationship to Africa, they can never be a healthy people. Because as a people in Africa, we spent millions of years there. We spent only 500 years of slavery outside of Africa. And it's only a fool that will give millions of years of history when they were free and creative to take 500 years of slavery. Matter of fact, if somebody tries to introduce anything into our people which doesn't match with their culture, it will never go anywhere. As a young man in high school in New York, I came into contact with Marxist Leninist philosophy. I enjoyed it. I read it and studied it. I devoured it. Among the youth, they couldn't understand it. I won my people free, and this had all the analysis that I was looking for. But there were areas which I couldn't deal with. One of these areas was the area of religion. To be a Marxist Leninist, you had to be an atheist. An atheist is not someone who doesn't believe in God. An atheist affirms that God does not exist. That's a heavy one. I would tell my uh, mentors in the Communist Party in USA in America, I said, listen, I can go for this. I can even be an atheist, but my people, <laughs> no way, Jose, <laughs> not in this generation. <laughs> not in this generation. And of course, there was always constant struggle. This constant struggle. I said, you will not be able to impose any ideology on my people in this generation, and certainly for future generations, that imposes upon them atheism. They will never accept it because these people use religion in their struggle against imperialism. <laughs> While Karl Marx and V.I. Engels and the Communist Manifesto said religion is the opium of the masses, they're absolutely correct. But this is for Europe. We must never make the particular history of Europe the universal history of the world. Never. Never. If we just look at the relationship of religion historically to Europe, we will see Africa in terms of her spirituality and her development to world, her contributions to world development in the line of religion gave monotheism to the world. Belief in one God came out of Africa. As a matter of fact, the very first sacred book in the world, entitled the Egyptian Book of the Dead, which is an incorrect title, came out of Africa. And not only that, the first god in Africa was not a he god, but a she god. <laughs> She's called Isis or Isis by the Greeks. I S I S. The African story is As A A S T. The first god then in the world, the first one of these god was a she god. Africa gave monotheism to the world. Africa gave Judaism to the world. Africa stabilized Christianity for the world. The little clip we saw reminded me about the struggle we had. These Africans just are so confused by imperialism that they refuse to think clearly for themselves, even read what's given to them. Do you know that while we are so enthusiastic about religion, all of us who call ourselves Christians, over 95% of them have never read the Bible from cover to cover. <laughs> And not only that, before they die and go home and see the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, peace be upon his name, because he needs it with followers like these, they ain't going to read the Bible. <laughs> but just reading the Bible puts so much to rest on Africa's relationship to religion. The first church in the world comes out of Africa. The first monastery in the world comes out of Africa. The very intellectual development of the world, as we said, comes out of Alexandria, which is in Egypt, which has never left Africa and never will leave Africa and is fundamental to Africa's history. And as the sister says, the United States, the further back you go into Egypt's history, the blacker it becomes. <laughs> about the color of Jesus Christ, peace be upon his name. But we know what we say is the truth. Jesus Christ, peace be upon his name, never put his foot in Europe, nowhere, at no time, under any condition. Any Christian here 
Romeo can show me the history of Jesus Christ, peace be upon the name, can show me in the Bible where Jesus Christ was in Europe, I will surrender before all. He never went there. We are not quibbling about his color, but what we say is true. Jesus Christ, peace be upon his name, could be just about any color, but the one color he definitely could not be is the color they always paint him. You said it, I didn't. <laughs> As a matter of fact, the Bible says he had hair like a lamb's wool. Only person got hair like a lamb's wool is a dreadlock. <laughs> the only reason we're touching on this is to let you know that Africa has made great contributions to humanity. They are hidden. We can't even see it at all. We never see Africa anywhere, and Africa is everywhere. We must come to be as proud as Africans, in, to be as proud to be Africans in Trinidad as Indians are proud to be Indians in Trinidad. And this we know, at all. In order to do this, we must work hard to build up our culture. In order to do this, we must each of us make a contribution to advance our history. We have no understanding of our history. We said it all the time. No African living in Trinidad can start their history with the arrival of Africans in Trinidad because that means you origin in slavery. Anybody originates in slavery will die in slavery. The only place we were free was in Africa. Therefore, the only place we can be in our history is in Africa. This must be made clear. We're going to pump this question up, especially this reigniting the African spirit. This time, when we reignite it, we must understand nobody is going to ever put it out again. Nobody. We are conscious of the time, therefore we'll not spend much time. We only want to make some remarks about Trinidad and then some of the remarks about Pan-Africanism. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, yes, he will, I'm sure. Especially the Minister of Foreign Affairs. Wasn't he beautiful? The statement he read for us this evening? <laughs> I must say, Pastor, the only Prime Minister I ever met in Trinidad was President, was the Prime Minister Bande. You know that, don't you? <laughs> And the only government who told me I should come to Trinidad and stay here was the Indian government. <laughs> you know, as a revolutionary, you must turn negatives to positives. i give you one example. The United States of America, an unjust country, has an unjust blockade against Cuba for decades. For decades. Because of this unjust blockade against Cuba, Cuba has had to go deeper into herbal medicines to solve the problem. Therefore, Cuba today has some of the best herbalist doctors in the world. As a revolutionary, we know everything has positive and negatives. We must take the positives that we're looking. Having an Indian government, I think, is a very positive thing for Trinidad. Excuse me. If you read the history of Trinidad, you will see the political action is always led by the Africans. This is a fact. Now the Indians need some experience with political struggle. They need it, and now they will have it. This will come to strengthen both the Africans and the Indians in their political knowledge, their political capabilities of dealing with the enemies that oppress us both on the island of Trinidad. Therefore, we should be happy that they're getting this experience. We want to make one statement clear. We said on the press that racial unity between the Africans and the Indians 
will only come along class lines that must be properly understood. We're not saying that the Africans do not have to be involved in racial consciousness, not us. They must be involved in it. Once we talk about unity with them, we cannot have the African masses aligned with the rich Indians. We must align only with the poor Indians because it's these poor Indians who, like us, have nothing to lose and will take revolution to its final victory. Therefore, our alliances must be aligned with them. We know absolutely nothing about each other's culture. I'm willing to bet you on any basis that 95% of the people in Trinidad, either African or Indian, know more about Western culture than they do about each other's culture, culture even their own culture. This must stop immediately. We must come to know about the glorious history that India has. You cannot respect somebody unless you know their history, not the his not their history given to you by their enemy. It must be their authentic history. And anyone reading the authentic history of India would have to be happy for India. She's made such great contributions to humanity and such flourishing civilizations until the British came and took all that away. Therefore, when you read the history of India, you must not read British India. You must read India before the British came to India, and then you begin to respect Indians. As a matter of fact, Indians themselves should be reading this history in Trinidad, so they too can respect themselves. All right, we do not want to waste much time except to say one thing. Indiana, British imperialism, put the Africans and the Indians at each other's throat in the early 60s. We're all witness to that here. Nobody won except the British. Trinidad will not allow them to do that here. The Indians and the Africans will not fight for the interest of imperialism. It's only unity that will drive these forces out. Therefore, this unity must come seriously. Now, let me tell you something about unity. It don't just happen. You've got to work for it. If you think the enemy just divides us like that, you make a mistake. They work to keep us divided. And therefore, if we want to be united, we've got to work to counteract their work. Therefore, if you want unity, you've got to work for it. Everybody, everybody, everybody has a responsibility to work for unity. And it's very easy. When you want unity, you have to create an atmosphere of unity. To create the atmosphere, you just stop saying negatives about each other. That's all. I mean, just think about the great change that would come to Trinidad if Africans would say nothing stupid about Indians and Indians would say nothing stupid about Africans. That alone would change the Imperialism brought us here together, forced us to live here together. Imperialism is seeking to destabilize the world. You can see them in Africa. That great son of Africa, Kwame Nkrumah, correctly told us neo-colonialism is the last stage of imperialism. Those of us who understand history understand he's correct. After the stage of neo-colonialism, we're going directly to socialism. There's no question here. Anyone following this can clearly see it. Imperialism knows this. In Africa, they tried to oppress us by bringing in military regimes, but the culture of Africa has nowhere in its tradition military regimes. Everywhere you see Africans fighting, they were political leaders. Queen Nzinga fought a military war for 17 years against the Portuguese, but she was a political leader who had to defend the political freedom of the people through military means. Shaka Zulu, political. Samari Ture, political. Yaya Santoe, political. Every leader you find in Africa who fought colonialism was a political leader, not a military leader. As a matter of fact, if you knew properly African tradition, when a political leader died, his military chief committed suicide and they went together. So there was no chance of the military corrupting the political rule in Africa. Imperialism came and changed all that. They imposed, they imposed military regimes all over Africa. 
But each of these military regimes have fallen one by one by one by one, and soon all of them will fall. Imperialism now understands it cannot depend upon the military to exploit the people. The civilian regimes cannot do it. Therefore, their hope is to destabilize Africa. And they start a great war. They start in the east, west coast and the east coast of Africa, in Somalia and in Liberia. And then when things are heating up, they run to Central Africa in Rwanda. And of course, you know, their propaganda, you know, imperialist propaganda does not lie some of the time. It lies all of the time. But it tells the truth is the result of a double lie. It lies all the time. Here they came. Oh, in Liberia, you have warlords. You have this. In, uh, what they have in Somalia, warlords. In Rwanda, you just have tribal warfare. Oh, they make it sound like they had nothing at all to do with the problem when the problem is them. The United States of America knows Liberia better than Portugal knows Angola. And Portugal stayed 500 years in Angola. All the war in Liberia is a result of American imperialism incapable of dominating Liberia with, with military rule now comes to try to destabilize Africa. But I promise you, as Africa is our mother, all their attempts will be in vain. On the contrary, they're heightening the consciousness of the people in Africa everywhere, preparing the grounds for Pan-Africanism, the total liberation and unification of Africa under scientific socialism. Let me just tell you something about Pan-Africanism then before I end. You know, many people think that somehow we who call ourselves Pan-Africanism have chosen this and chosen this, and we love violence and we love blood. I'm a revolutionary. I've seen a lot, a lot of blood in my life. I've seen a lot of blood in my life. I'm sure if I live, I shall see more blood. But I promise you, I hate blood more than anybody else in the world, but I love my people more than I hate blood. So therefore, if I've got to shed blood for my people, don't worry about it. I'm shedding the blood for the liberation of the masses of my people. If you will look at anthropologists, they will tell us that all societies have a tendency to go from small, smaller social aggregates to larger social aggregates, from the family, to the clan, to the tribe, to the nation, to the continent. This is an evolutionary process and innate to all societies. We can certainly prove the truth of this from looking at England. England, which has fought more bloody patricidal wars than all the continents put together, today speaks of European unity. European unity. Therefore, Europe itself, which has gone through all these wars, is speaking of European unity. Africa, equal to every other society on her own, was evolving from smaller social aggregates to larger social aggregates. This process, which left untrampled, would have led to continental unity, was interrupted by European imperialism in the form of slavery and colonialism. This must be properly understood. Africa was developing by itself. If the European imperialism had left it alone, we would have continued to develop a continental wide scale. But it was interrupted by imperialism in the form of slavery and colonialism. In the form of slavery, European imperialism took 300 million Africans out of Africa. And they were the young and the strong. They were the young and the strong. America today has a population of 280. Let's give it 300 million. If we were to take 50 million of the young and strong out of America, our productive forces will fall miserably. When you take 300 million Africans, the young and the strong, out of Africa, you destroy completely our productive forces. They weren't even satisfied with slavery. After having drained us out of Africa, the colonial powers sat down in Berlin in 1864 and divided Africa. The French took a piece. The Germans took a piece. The Italians took a slice, the Portuguese took a slice, little Belgium took a slice 50 times as big as she is and 50 times squared her wealth. Every country in Europe had a piece of Africa. I am certain that these colonial powers thought that having committed slavery, dragged us out of Africa, having divided up Africa, that somehow this innate will for a unified continent will leave us. They made a mistake. They heightened the pressure for a unified Africa. This can be seen everywhere. Now, we just tell you now, our onward evolutionary process towards continental unity has been interrupted by imperialism. 
this evolutionary process was interrupted. Therefore, the only way we can arrive at a unified socialist African continent is through revolution. You must understand then, the choice of revolution is not ours, it's historically determined. Had they left us alone, we would have been developed. They didn't leave us alone. They will never leave us alone until we destroy them and unify our continent. Therefore, we must take revolutionary steps to unify our continents. Now, Africa, I want to tell you, is going to be the first unified continent in the world. I want to give you just two examples, but I give you many, that's my job. I give you only two. We will take a political example and a cultural example. Now, you know, one of the terrible things about Africa right now is that, well, to put it quite bluntly, the scum of our race is an authority everywhere in Africa. They hold the power. And I mean the real scum of our race. I've seen bourgeoisie all over the world. And I know the African bourgeoisie is the most disgusting and the most corrupting because they seek individual luxury in the midst of mass suffering at the expense of the masses. <laughs> Remember, we have nothing but the scum of our race then. All of them are against Africa. Many of them actively work for the CIA. I told you that Europe is talking about European unity, and it's true. But sometimes you can listen on the world press and hear leaders of certain European nations say, I'm against European unity because if we have European unity, it will affect our fisheries, it will affect our agriculture, it will affect our tariffs. And these European leaders actually get up and make these statements that they're not for European unity. I told you the scum of our race rules us in Africa today, and that's virtually true. But not one of them can ever publicly get up and say they are not for African unity, ever. Even Mobutu, who works for the CIA to divide Africa, must claim he is for African unity. The reason? The masses of the people want African unity more than they want anything else. I'll give you only one last example, that is a cultural area. I've heard many songs in the world, and I've heard songs sang to Britain, to France, to Germany, and I've never heard one song sang to Europe. I don't know if one exists, but I've never heard it. But the songs I've heard about Africa, I can stop with Bob Marley, who wasn't even born inside of Africa. Everywhere, Africans sing about Africa. I mean, even in Trinidad, where the Calypso don't talk nothing but jump up for stupidness, they too got to sing, how you doing, Mother Africa? Yes, everybody has to talk about Africa. And not only that, if you take the continents of the world and put them up, I'll bet you the one that's recognized all over the world by everyone is Africa, thanks to the work of the African people whose culture develops around always a unified Africa. Charles walked out here. Africa was on his map. Everybody knew it was Africa. I bet if he had Europe on there, wouldn't nobody know it was Europe. But everybody knows Africa when they see it, thanks to the work of the African masses who always push a unified African continent. Africa will be free, unified, and socialist before any other continent in the world. Finally, we must tell you that the greatest damage to colonialism and neocolonialism does to us as a people is that it makes us irresponsible to our political responsibilities. It makes us irresponsible to our political responsibilities. If we're not careful, some political parties will come and do the same thing. Like in America, they tell the people, you must vote once every four years. And after you vote, all right, go back and sleep. We'll take care. We'll run the government for you till the next vote. This is total irresponsibility on the part of the people. Politics direct our lives, whether we like it or not. The price of bread in Trinidad is decided by politics. How many jobs are available are decided by politics. The education we get in the schools is decided by politics. Even what the preacher says in the churches is decided by politics. <laughs> Therefore, it doesn't make sense for us not to be involved in politics. Oh, God, boy, don't talk that thing, you know. I ain't in it, but it's in you. <laughs> it dominates you. Each of us must become politically responsible. <laughs> Each of us must become politically responsible. 
how do we become politically responsible? By being politically involved in the political affairs of our country on a daily basis. I didn't say once in a while, I said on a daily basis. Africans, you know, have been subdued by this capitalist philosophy, especially here in Trinidad. The capitalist philosophy makes it feel that you're supposed to struggle, 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 and after you struggle for a little while, you're supposed to relax and enjoy life. Just consume it. Well, it's a consumer society. <laughs> and Africans did the same thing. They fought for independence, and they thought they had power, and they said, oh, we got power, you can just relax. <laughs> We ain't got to do nothing else, everything is all right. <laughs> Struggle is eternal. And once you snatch power from imperialism, it's planning every minute how to snatch back more than you snatch from it. Therefore, the struggle is constant. The struggle is eternal. Those of you who started struggling when you were small, I got news for you. If you're conscious, you're going to struggle till you die. And the only time you will find rest is when you die. Like my father used to tell me. So why you work so hard? Why don't you get some rest? Don't worry, son. Oh boy, boy, when I dead, I got a lot of time to rest, you know. <laughs> While you're alive, you must work for your people constantly. The reason why we suffer the way we do all over the world, especially in Trinidad, is because as a people we are disorganized. Totally disorganized. As a people, we act together, but we do not think together. If you were to take just a spotlight and just to run quickly over the events of the world in the African world, you will see that we really act together. If you look at the independence movement, it was a spontaneous bust of combustion. The people got up, they got mad, their imperialists backed up, gave a flag and ran away, and everything was all right. And then after they ran away, we sat down and forgot about the struggle. Look at them in America, they're even funnier there. This is the truth. This is a hard, oh, honest truth. I'm a revolutionary. I can't lie to you, and I can't lie to you because you want to fight to bring me back here. So I can never lie to you. But uh, when I was in, uh, what year was it? Rodney King was that in 1992, there was a Rodney King rebellion in Los Angeles in April. April. I was in Los Angeles in February of that year. Now, since I've been in America, I've always taken time out to go and deal with the gangs. I've been doing this since the 1960s. I know their mentality, I know the talks, we can deal with them. Los Angeles has two of the roughest gangs called the Crips and the Bloods. But now let me tell you, they were spawned by imperialism. See, I'm not confused. I know the drugs in America come to America by the police. I know the police bring the drugs into the community in America. I don't know what's going on in Trinidad, but I know in America the police bring the drugs into America. Come together and as a unified force, we will transform Trinidad into what it can be, a place that gives everyone decent house, decent job, decent shelter, and perfect and total security living in harmony. It cannot be done by a few of us. It has to be done by all of us.